So there was a period in time where I saw promise in things like XRP, in Ethereum, in Cardano. And funnily enough, from my enterprise consulting lens, Cardano was the one that was actually the most intriguing of those blockchains because it was enterprise focused around improved governance, slower releases to ensure that it was the right thing, that we weren't pushing, that they weren't pushing out anything that was buggy or that introduced more errors. But when you peel it back and you're saying, well, what's different between all those other blockchains and Bitcoin? Number one, when all of them went proof of stake, it killed a massive benefit that Bitcoin bring, which was proof of work, actual decentralization, which is critical to both the security of, of the blockchain itself. But to your point, the permissionless of that blockchain was critical and they just wiped it out. So to that point, I don't think that there, you, there's no other conversation here. It's, it's either really Bitcoin and then a whole raft of other things. All right, Arvind, welcome to Bitcoin for Millennials. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man, thanks for coming on. I, I enjoy your writing and I thought it would be fun to to chat, to like dive into some of the pieces and the thoughts that that you shared there. And I wanted to start with, I think, a big question, but I, I think you'll have a good answer to this. Why is Bitcoin so unique? Okay, so I'll, I'll give a little backstory yeah. before I dive into, dive into the answer for a bit more context. Why I think Bitcoin is so unique. So when I joined the space, I was in 2017. It was dipping my toe in the water. That was my shitcoin phase where I was into Ethereum. I was doing a whole raft of consulting work around smart cities here in Australia and Figuring out the digital backbone for the country was one of the tasks that I had as a consultant. And Ethereum was kind of sexy at the time for that smart contracts. You could program things in a blockchain. Brilliant. Anyway, realized it was going to be totalitarian and it was going to take over the world. So I stopped that research and I sort of exited the space. Came back in in 2020. We were locked down. We were in Melbourne. We had the longest lockdowns of any city in the world. So that opens your eyes up to controls. That's where I got, that's where I really started my Bitcoin journey in, in that uh, summer of 2020 over here during the height of our lockdowns and realized that it was liber, that Bitcoin as a capital, as, a, as an asset, because it had so limited controls, as in no controls at all, you had full control over what you owned, gave you a lot of autonomy and freedom through that, where the government could not exert their control over you. And so that resonated with me at the time. And that's when I decided all in on learning about it. And as you go through the learning phases, my mind was always leaning towards the, those experiences that led me to the space. That was, I wanted full control of all everything that I owned. I wanted my own self-sovereignty. I was seeing the government, not corruption per se, but government control of society expanding beyond what it was intended. And I thought, okay, this is great. But at the back of my mind, there was always something like I was missing something in this journey of exploration and learning. And so I kept asking myself, why, why? And I couldn't quite nail it. And I think it was probably to the tail end of last calendar year was when it hit me. I was doing some listening on podcasts. I was listening to, at the time, Jordan Peterson going through his biblical series work that he was doing at the time. I was raised as a Hindu, although I'm agnostic now. And so I had this religious upbringing. And then I realized that Bitcoin actually wasn't solving for money and giving us all these freedoms. Bitcoin was solving for human behavior and the, what I'll call the innate sinful tendencies that we all innately have. And when I sort of made this connection between actually it's human behavior that we're solving for, not for money, that was my moment of, okay, now this all starts to make sense. And that's sort of like the, unique answer to that question it is it's not solving for money at all it's solving for human behavior i love that yeah i i think it's one of the things that also clicked for me i don't even know who said it i i think it's also eric talking to eric Kaysen when he talked about nihilism and optimism and yeah the, the fact that we are controlled without knowing by the the tool that we use to exchange value has all these like secondary and, and, and tertiary effects, right? And before we continue into that, because you said, you know, I was consulting on Ethereum, I also wanted to ask you a question about, you know, all these other blockchain projects, right? Would you agree that the only application of a permissionless blockchain is Bitcoin or is, is money? Sorry, because all these, all these consultants, 
right? With all these different types of crypto projects, trying to apply them in a corporate world, etc. Eventually, that's all permissions, right? So there's still some centralized control of, you know, the, the rules or etc. And so, yeah, I'm pretty strong on the point that the only application of a permission is blockchain is money, but I wanted to get your thought on that too. I will agree. Yes, is money and is specifically Bitcoin. So there was a period in time where I saw promise in things like XRP, in Ethereum, in Cardano. And funnily enough, from my enterprise consulting lens, Cardano was the one that was actually the most intriguing of those blockchains because it was enterprise focused around improved governance, slower releases to ensure that it was the right thing that we weren't pushing, that they weren't pushing out anything that was buggy or that introduced int- uh, more errors. But when you peel it back and you're saying, well, what's different between all those other blockchains and Bitcoin? Number one, when all of them went proof of stake, it, it killed a massive benefit that Bitcoin bring, which was proof of work, actual decentralization, which is critical to both the security of, of the blockchain itself, but to, to your point, the permissionlessness of that blockchain was critical and they just wiped it out. Mm. So to that point, I don't think that there, you, there's no other conversation here. It's, it's either really Bitcoin and then a whole raft of other things. And I'll draw a parallel of how it, how it forms in my mind. Bitcoin and shit coins is like the internet in 1999, 2000. When you started seeing all of these websites like pets.com and anything.com went IPO'd, it was massive bull market run everything. And then it all crashed. And then suddenly all of those other things fell away because they realized this was all hype. This was all BS. And only the, the dominant value creating companies at the time survived, i.e. Amazon was probably the best example in that period. I think we're in that moment right now with these blockchain projects where it's all hype. We can all do all these great things, but Bitcoin is showing that it's proof of work. It's, and it's overall architecture and principles are so solid. Like Amazon was back in 99, the others are just going to completely fall away to almost nothing. And what I think is going to happen is to your point, we need this fundamental technology in Bitcoin, but you're going to build on top of it. And so the piece that gave me hope around this element as to why it's going to be Bitcoin that wins out here is MicroStrategy's orange platform around decentralized identity and identity on top of Bitcoin. Because what that has proven now is you don't actually need Ethereum because of these smart contracts so you can get better programmability. Michael Saylor with this platform has shown, actually, you can build on top of Bitcoin. And here's one example as to how we can do it. And all of those things as a consultant that I was thinking we could use other blockchains for, I can now see a pathway as a result of that innovation on Bitcoin. I like that. Yeah. I, it's also when you said, you know, when they moved to proof of stake, I think Jack Mahler's had a really good talk. I think it was in Prague. It's called uh, There Is No Second Best. And there he talks about the differences between Bitcoin and crypto and and the value and the importance of proof of work connecting the physical world, physical energy mm-hmm. to its digital creation, right? And, and there's there's no other token or coin, you know, like I, 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 in general, I don't like to talk about crypto. I mean, I had the same phase, but it's just a totally different thing. Like we, we shouldn't even compare it, but if we would compare it, the, the biggest differentiator is this proof of work. Proof of work initiates all these little game theories and incentives to keep Bitcoin alive, secure, decentralized, and connected also to, again, that physical energy that's used to create the digital asset, basically, where, you know, you could say that Bitcoin is, is like a metaphysical representation of the energy that it used to that was used to to produce it right and yeah moving to proof of stake is basically moving back to like fiat money the people closer to the, to the origination of the tokens itself. i would also add to that that the other element is it's decentralized in, in that there is no central control for the code that underpins those those blockchains so bitcoin purely decentralized it is a merit-based system where you can put a bip up but unless it gets 
full acceptance across the network. It's not going to go live. Whereas if you go to the Ethereum Foundation or Input Output that looks after Cardano and whatnot, they have unilateral control over it. So I think it's those two in combination. Yes, it's proof of work, but you could have a proof of work blockchain that is centrally controlled exactly. because there's no yeah. consensus algorithm around the changes. I think those two in, in conjunction with each other are the, are the powerhouse of Bitcoin. Does your Bitcoin custody setup keep you up at night? Gain peace of mind with OnRamp and their multi-institution custody solution. OnRamp creates a dedicated multi-signature vault for you and three separate institutions each hold a key, which are OnRamp, BitGo, and CoinCover. But none of them can move funds unilaterally, only you have control. These institutions can only sign with your instruction. OnRamp's multi-institution custody eliminates single points of failure, reduces your personal attack service and technical burden, and provides access to financial services that allow you to secure your Bitcoin, including inheritance planning, insurance-backed warranties for all balances and transactions, low-cost trading, and more. Check out onrampbitcoin.com through my link in the description below and receive $250 in Bitcoin when you join. If you want to self-custody your Bitcoin stack, I recommend the Foundation Passport, a premium Bitcoin-only hardware wallet. I've been using mine for about a year now, and I love the design and ease of use. And with Foundation's mobile wallet companion app Envoy, your initial onboarding is super smooth and straightforward. The Passport is fully air-gapped, which means you never have to connect it to the internet or any computer. The Passport serves as a signing device to sign transactions on your Envoy app, or any of your other favorite software wallets like Sparrow or Blue Wallet. The Foundation Passport also offers encrypted backups on a micro SD card and is built with 100% open source hardware and software. I love what Zach and the team at Foundation are building. And to learn more about their mission, please check out episode 27 of this podcast. If you consider buying a Foundation Passport, you can use code BRAM, that's B-R-A-M, to get $10 off at foundation.xyz slash BRAM. Yeah. Yeah, I love how you can pull a thread on Bitcoin and then, you know, when you're a few steps further, it, it already becomes, of course, a, a bit more complex. I love how you went from consultant, you know, not only being a consultant, but let's say in this space, you know, it's, it's, you go from this application and technical kind of point of view towards, you know, you just mentioned Bitcoin eventually solves human behavior, solves our innate greed. I mean, that's a big arc to make. Can you elaborate a bit on that? Like how, how that went? I mean, you listened to this podcast as you shared, but like wh what made that click for you and yeah, wh why is it important to understand? So th there are a few life experiences that I drew from. One, I mentioned that I was raised in a religious household. My family is Hindu. My wife's a Buddhist. And so there's a lot of non- I'll call it IT techie consulting elements of my life that help contribute to my worldview. And I think the worldview framing becomes important that I look at something greater than oneself. And so it draws you to these things around how can I be better? And it then goes down behavior. But the other part that helped build the framework for me to make the link was for about 12 months, I was doing my PhD in looking at digital transformation in nonprofit organizations. But it was very much a information system, social sciences approach to the problem. And so as I was going through those first few milestones on a literature review, understanding the space, looking at experimental methodology, I started to open up beyond just what I'd call the objective quantitative, as in the numbers and whatnot, as justification for something. And I started looking at the qualitative elements. And so the, that brought balance to me because I'm actually a physics major as a background in terms of my studies to then now bring qualitative information into this puzzle forced me to start thinking slightly differently. And when I started to bring all of these things together, because I was sort of just on the tail end of, I was about to exit my PhD. It was way too much effort. I, could, I couldn't keep up with a full-time job and doing a PhD at the same time. It all sort of came together. Uh, and that was the framing that got me there. And it was the religious element of it, that family values element of it. Jordan Peterson's talks on his biblical series, that part was also quite important as part of the puzzle. And a line from my, my late father, he said, religion is not about the gods that we pray to, but it is a way of life. And so I started to link religion and and what you, we could sometimes call doctrine to actually just 
principles in which you could live your life by so that in the eyes of a, of a creator, of a God, or of whoever it is that your, your religion aligns to, you are a good person worthy of heaven, salvation, you name it, depending on the religion. So I was able to bring all of that. And I think it was a broader life experience that helped me get to that point of, yes, there's a behavior element to it. And we can probably go into some of the detail as to what that looks like. Because at the end of the day, it is us as humans that are using a system that pervert that system. It's not the system itself mm -hmm. that is broken per se. And so yeah. when you take it, so that's what really led me there. Yeah. Yeah. I really like that last part, right? Like it's it, what I don't like is when I hear Christine Lagarde say, Oh, we have to tame the beast of inflation. Like this, <laughs> like it came out of nowhere, right? Like, no, it's, it's all man made. You know, it's, it's the money that we use is, is engineered as opposed to perhaps the money that was used, you know, way, way back in, in that, that was decided more upon in, in like a more natural or organic way. Right. But you, yeah, you cannot argue <laughs> that the, the current money system is not designed, right? It's engineered in, in a certain way. And as you said, like that, that is a certain way you can debate about, you know, is that malicious or whatever. But I think this, the, the point that we uh, are talking about is more about when there is opportunity to corrupt it, people will do it. Right. And for me personally, when I realized, I, I also heard someone say in, oh, this was about like uh, US war crimes and someone, or maybe it was on Rogue and they showed, I think, Madeleine Albright. And when she talked about the first Gulf War, where I think like 200,000 children or something died. And they showed a little interview with her where they asked her, you know, do you think that's justifiable, right? Or, or that was in line with how the war was. And her answer was yes, or something like yes, of course, right? Let's, this is not about the topic, but then they talked about that and they said, you know, you, you can be disgusted by this, rightly so, but there are people that make this decision they do they do it right and so you can always say like i would never do that if i was in that position you know i'm a righteous person etc cetera, etc cetera. but once you realize that yeah from a distance it's easy to say but once you get the opportunity to to do something or abuse something how horrible that is you would probably do it for your own gain right not talking about mur murdering all the children right like that that it's not about that subject it's more about the principle of yeah once you get the opportunity to do something that benefits you before others then you would probably do it and then they started talking about the corruptibility right you see that in children children are very egotistical right like give me food i need food like you see that and that's really also what triggered me to think about that like once you accept that we all have that even though from a distance we would say i would never do that if i was in that position right once you accept that you have that and you connect that to the money that you're using and you see that there's people who profit from the creation of the money at the you know near the point of the creation of the money and there's people who don't profit from that you know below the down down on the ladder let's say then you also, or well, at least for me, I came to realize that this is not a good tool. Like this is a tool that incentivizes corruption for the people that, you know, randomly show up at the, at the right place and see this opportunity. And that's where the need kind of comes from for a neutral money that it's okay that it's designed, right? Like Bitcoin is an engineered, but there have to be rules and safeguards in place or incentivized to just keep it like that and not mess it up. I think the the slight difference that I have on what you just said, and I agree with pretty much 90% of it, the element that I look at is the that, that last comment on the system incentivizes it. My framing when I looked at it was, it's not that the system incentivizes it. The system has left the door open for you to express that behavior that walks through that door. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by that is, the fiat system, I want to make a very controversial statement in and amongst Bitcoin communities here. The fiat system is actually a, a great system. It could work perfectly. But the assumption that we have for this system is that no one is going to manifest or express their innate sins of pride, greed, gluttony, lust, envy, wrath, or sloth. Yes. And we make that assumption going into it because, and I won't put it in, in the, 
thought experiment of, you know, the, the killing of, of the children, which I think is an appropriate one to some degree, but let's put it in the context of. Yeah, it was just father. an example that, Correct. that triggered me. Right. Yeah. Correct. But, and I, I would add to that another perspective of imagine you're a father, which you actually are. So imagine you, you're the father, you've got a child and a, and a wife and you're at the point of starvation. And you've got this monetary system that allows you to print money because you can borrow it from the reserve bank and it issues you money and that money can then give you food. Now, the system's intent is actually you can't, you shouldn't print the money, but you're, you've been, you're now faced with the dilemma of, but if I print it now, it's fast, it's easy. It gets my family fed. They survive. I'm doing what's right by me for survival. Just in that example there. You, it's not that there's an incentive, it's that, it's that the door is open and it's based on trust. Mm-hmm. And the problem is the trust element that yes. you won't manifest a behavior that is innate in all of us. And, and I think that there's a evolutionary biology element to each of those sins and why we actually need to control that through closing these doors that are in our systems. Yeah, I think that's a great addition. I think, yeah, I, I fully align with that. It is that, right? Like w- once you get this opportunity, you will probably take it. And it's not only realizing that you would do it, but also realizing that anyone else would do that. And and also coming to terms, I would say that that is also happening, right? I mean, um, yeah, I talked about this a lot, but if, if, you, if you grow up in a Western country and everything is great, like you never question you just think it works, right? You never question or can even believe that people would abuse the system that gives you so much value, right? So it feels so, so, so foreign, but I think, you know, it's this example that, that you give, I think is, is a, is a, is a daily occurrence for a lot, a lot of people, right? And then it's also not fair that if people, I, I also love the, the, the concept of thinking like if, if three people in three different countries do the same thing, deliver the same value, but they are rewarded in a different money, then their human effort, their human energy is rewarded in a different way, which is just, I don't know, it's nonsensical for me. Like it's not, it's not equal, right? And yeah, it's funny how like you have all these different topics that eventually get to, <laughs> you need a neutral global money that even if people want to mess with it, the other can't, or the incentive to just adopt it is bigger. And that is just really profound. Especially in a globally connected society, I would I would agree with that. I run another thought experiment. If the African continent was completely locked away from all of us and they became self-sufficient, then it doesn't matter what currency they're in. What matters is, is the energy expended getting them a lifestyle or a life return mm. uh, for that effort. And are they able to send that effort through future generations so that others can benefit from their innovation and, and, and efforts? And as long as that is preserved, then it doesn't really matter what it's rewarded in. It's when we get globally connected to your point and there's no parity between what one person does maybe in Africa versus what one someone does in Silicon Valley, yeah. where the innovation and the value, and then suddenly you create this arbitrage, which is going to be exploited which is what we sort of see today in IT. We see it in exploiting workers out of India, China, uh, Sri Lanka, Pakistan for developers and whatnot. We don't hire mass developers on shores in Western countries. We outsource it to all these other areas because mm-hmm. there's this arbitrage. Yeah. So to the point of, if you really want true meritocracy globally, you do need a single measuring stick and unit of account. And if you get rid of the printing and the inflationary uh, tactics, then you li- you likely, I can't, you can't guarantee it, but you will likely get to that outcome. Yeah. Yeah. When you mentioned Africa, I thought that's, it's also, yeah, if the reward for the input of the energy, right, can be stored through time and space for, for generations, then you actually have also a path to, to getting out of poverty or building up a country or building up a community, right? Because like this, this ball of energy, economic energy or cap, you know, capital keeps growing and you can keep building instead of consuming and uh, deteriorating it all the time. Right. And I think also just that is, is that concept, uh, like I don't have a e-com or or finance background, like that is just so mind blowing to me because it makes so much sense. Like you would want to work and build towards the future instead of 
use everything you have right now. Like you need to continue progressing and making things better, right? I think in general, that's what humans always want to do. But yeah, the, the, the money that we're using is kind of blocking that. It's not blocking it. it it's, it's eroding <laughs> it. If, yeah. if it just blocked it and we kept what we had, happy days, maybe. Good point. This yeah. is actually eroding it to the point where we're inflating it away. My energy has been stolen from me yeah. and given to those that are going to benefit from massive inflation, which to your point is those who are closest to where the money is being printed. So how would a society or, or how would our human behavior change if we would live in a, our user money system that's fully driven by Bitcoin? So this is the piece that scared me when and led me to my research publication, The Bitcoin Curve, where I look at how do we scale Bitcoin beyond money? And that question there is the epitome of what this publication is here to do. In a world where we have Bitcoin as the standard, it effectively closes the door on all of these exit paths that allow people to express their, I'll call it sinful behaviors, greed and gluttony are the big ones, sloth, the aversion to doing work. When you close that door, my mind goes to, if, if I were benefiting from a system where I got the easy way out, and that's what I was used to, what are the chances that I am going to change my behaviors overnight if those avenues in the monetary system were no longer available to me? And my mind went to, it's unlikely they're going to change. What they're going to do is they're going to find the next best path to express those behaviors and still get the return. So once you solve the monetary system, they're going to go to anywhere else that they can go. So my mind goes to politics is probably the big one because when you're close to regulation and policy, you are able to skew the playing field towards one side or the other and you can benefit from that quite easily as a result of that power. If you think of what Bitcoin's doing, it's decentralizing everything rather than centralizing it. By having elected officials, you're actually centralizing a lot of decision making and you're, and you're putting in trust and Bitcoin is trustless. So you can already see there that that exit path is into politics. And the, and the scarier part is when you start to go to all the other elements of our civilization. And the next two that I'm going to focus on is education and healthcare in my public, in my research efforts is if you've got central control and you look at universities today. They largely control the ability to certify anyone to become a doctor, to become an engineer. And you need those certifications in order to do those disciplines. And, and you can't do that unless you pay them huge amounts of money in order to get those qualifications for you to then get a job, to then earn money. If they maintain those levels of control, instead of stacking fiat currency that they're drawing from all of us, they're going to start stacking Bitcoin. And that becomes a scarier thought to me for for value that they have not created because the system is still in a status quo in all these other industries. It's only been solved for in money. And now if you're stacking Bitcoin, now you're starting to get this gravitational center within of power and influence because there's only 21 million Bitcoin. And so if they keep stacking it in this system, their power actually grows in this fictitious example. And so they're able to exert a whole much more pressure. And I'll, and as an example, when competition is trying to introduce and battle these big behemoths, they can undercut the competition because of their Bitcoin reserves, weather them out until these, these startups collapse and then raise their prices when this, when those startups are no longer there. And so they will recover all of their losses anyway. And that can only happen when you've got large amounts of capital that is energy stored from human activity to weather that storm. It's almost like, like supplies in a war. And just through that simple mechanism, especially where you've got government policy and controls that have not yet been solved for, Bitcoin can now be used as even greater influence than the fiat monetary system could because it's so scarce. And so my, my piece is, I think that if we close these doors in the fiat system, they're going to go to all the other industries where these arbitrage opportunities, these open doors in those systems are still open, which is why it's so critical to start understanding how do we understand how Bitcoin solved money and take those principles and those learnings and apply it to all these other industries so that entrepreneurs of the next decade are able to, to front run the Bitcoin standard and start plugging these holes across other industries in a Bitcoin 
ethos. And while I don't see this as a problem in 10, 10 or 20 years, it absolutely will if we get to a Bitcoin standard, which let's just arbitrarily say it's 30 years. That's when the clock starts. To have a little, perhaps a hopeful rebuttal to, to that. Yep. I think I, 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 I agree with this line of thinking. I think it's, it's great. I also think this should serve as a signal for people to understand how high level this, well, to the Meister calls it a war, right? It's, it's Bitcoin and a neutral global permissionless money would solve a lot of things that you don't realize are your problems, right? And because it's going to solve these things, there's a lot of things that going to bubble to the surface that are very uneasing to realize, I would say. But. Eventually, and, and I, 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 I would agree to the, to the word of war. It's just a really big battle. It's a really high level battle because eventually, you know, this, the incentives eventually get to the psychological, eventually get to the spiritual, right? I mean, we could go that way, but let, let's, let's stick there. So it's, I think what you just said is a really nice illustration and, and a signal for people to, to, to think about like the battle for money is, is almost like the ultimate battle, right? And, and, I'll, I'll quickly add that I don't think that that, I'll call it dystopian future, would be there in perpetuity. I think it'll eventually find its equilibrium, which is a more merit-based society yeah. on that Bitcoin standard. But what I think we could do with the research that I'm looking at, I hope others join this path, is reduce the time to reach that equilibrium because we can understand and make the changes ahead of time. So if we think about the injustices as a result of all of that impacting people around the world, that's a lot of pain for those people. Yes. And if that's extended by 20, 30 years, because we didn't do the thinking early enough, we allowed this to happen and it's going to take another 10, 20, 30 years for it to work out of a system. That's, that's a whole upbringing of a child from mm -hmm. birth all the way through to 30 in that system. Whereas if we can shorten it by even 10 years, that collective, when you're talking about time is energy, that collective effective energy saving for yeah, society exactly. and humanity would be massive for what yeah. is thinking and a bit of research from not a lot of people around the world. I think this is the main argument why we should never stop talking about Bitcoin and we have to educate our children on all the elements that make up Bitcoin. But but yeah, I would agree. So so the, the kind of more hopeful thing I, I wanted to say is I do think that because of this digital aspect, you know, we are talking, we are going to reach a few thousand people. People are going to, uh, some people are hopefully going to be triggered in a certain way by touch point. They're going to study, right? Like I think this I idea of bitcoin will will there's an advantage like we the, what we're battling is like a propaganda machine and a lot of beliefs and upbringing and all these things right but this idea this concept is already out there right like bitcoin is on the loose like you cannot stop this idea anymore and i think that the the digital world will help us to reach more people quicker and once you understand that bitcoin is the best money to earn you know, eventually Bitcoin is this individual mind virus. So if you would be part of, let's say, you know, a political party or a group that wants to exert its power over, over other people. Yeah. Do, do you get Bitcoin for that? Like for, <laughs> for your work, right? Or like, are there other, other ways for you to make money? Like eventually you're gonna, I would say this is the hopeful idea I have. You're going to reflect on what you're doing. You know, like, is this beneficial for me, for my children, for the future, et cetera. So even if you're, let's say, an evil person that wants to exude this control, you know, and they move into politics or food or health, as, as, as you said, yeah, who, who's going to pay for this education with their, with their Bitcoin? That's what I'm just thinking, right? Like if, if you know that Bitcoin is the best thing to earn, you know, it's also the most precious thing to spend. So you would only spend it on things that would actually be beneficial to your life. Right. And so, yeah, that's kind of my thought there that, that people would become more critical of what they would spend the money on. So the centralization of Bitcoin through, for example, you know, the, the, the food or the education angle, definitely possible. But I think because this message of Bitcoin is you are in control, this is the most precious thing you know, verifiably, people will be more critical. That's a hope. I, I, I don't know if I can substantiate that, but yeah, it's kind of where I went. Yeah, I, I could play, not the, the devil's advocate, I'd say that 
once it becomes the norm, does that, and you just trust Bitcoin where you don't have to think like we're coming at it from the lens of, we have to understand it fundamentally. And that came with a level of skepticism and understanding the fiat system. If you fast forward and you're saying, okay, I'm, I've just had a child. I'm raising that child. That child has only known Bitcoin. They have not known fiat. Are they going to carry the same level of skepticism? I think that what will actually happen is it'll soften. And it brings me back to this, this saying that I sometimes hear on Rogan and whatnot. Hard times create soft men. Soft men create hard times. No, no. Did I get that wrong? Soft men create hard times. Hard times create hard men and hard men create easy times. Easy yeah. times create soft men. I think we're in the point where millennials largely and maybe the ones after us, those that have been made into hard men through this, through this fiat system, our need to be skeptical, our need to start to fight back. We're beginning that hardening of ourselves to create the easy times. But if this cycle through civilization, which has always occurred through any civilization that's gone through its rise and then its fall occurs again here, the next generation after the hard times have been fought here in the monetary system by the early Bitcoiners, I, I don't put myself in that bucket. I think that they're the first two, two and a half percent of people. I'm in that early adopter phase because I only sort of came in in, in 2020. Once we get to mass adoption, we're back to being soft again because the battle's been fought. And mm. eventually in one to two generations, we'll get soft again and then something else will occur. Yeah, I, I would disagree with that because I think uh, Bi Bitcoin would invoke more true merit-based economy. So you have to do the work to get the reward, which eventually I would argue is would make you stronger as opposed to a person who currently makes money in a fiat economy because the, the retaliation for bad output is non-existent. Right. Well, you get bad money, so the retaliation takes a longer time for, to reach you, right? Because you are still a user of the bad money. But I see kind of Bitcoin as this mirror, you know, it exists next to this other system. And if you do your best in, in the field system, you know, you might earn money, but it's devalued anyway, right? All outside of your control. So the harder you know, people delivering, you know, let's say one person delivers 100% of value and the other person delivers 50, you know, you know, the consulting world <laughs> as I do, yeah, yeah. you know, they could be rewarded with the same amount of currency units, right? And so they earned the same, they earned the same thing. But I think in a Bitcoin world, th there's way more scrutiny on that because the fiat money is more like a fleeting reward where the 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 Bitcoin money is an eternal reward, right? Like once I give my Bitcoin to you, I can only get it back by doing the the, the, the yep. same you know, work that's on the same level to to receive the same value as a reward. So I think I think that would be rather confrontational. I think that would is hard for a lot of people, but I, I do think it's pretty clear. I do agree with all of that, and I think the piece that links these two things together is education. So yes. number one, it's if people don't understand what value, what is valuable and what is not, and can be easily persuaded as to something that is not valuable being valuable, then giving up Bitcoin will still feel like you're giving it up to something valuable, if that makes sense. In so the perception, to, yes. In their perception. And yeah. value is, is not an objective measure. Because perception is reality. What you perceive as valuable is valuable. So you need to get back to the core fundamental values in education to people to discern what is valuable and what isn't. And so it's not necessarily Bitcoin as the coin itself, the Bitcoin ethos, as long as it filters into early education to set in place the foundations to people with the skills, tools, knowledge to be able to perceive the world around them and mm -hmm. to come to this understanding of value, then I think we've, we've, we've fixed the fundamental problem, which is why I think education then becomes hugely important to everyone with what they need to be successful in that Bitcoin standard and not have the wool pulled over their eyes again by bad, these bad actors that may try to swindle you. Well, there will be bad actors that that will try to 100%. do it. I think, with, you know, that, that's a certainty. But yeah, I, I would argue that the feedback loop is shorter, right? So let's say I get scammed, you know, I buy something with my Bitcoin 
and you know it's, it's, it's a shitty product or a shitty service you know whatever whatever i buy yeah i would not recommend that to, to other people right like just just because bitcoin is so valuable and so scarce right yeah. if i go yeah i use the cake store analogy a lot right like if we both make cakes and we both have a store you know and, and, and yours are better than mine yeah i just you know go out of business so so and and I, and I would argue that's a good thing because if we are if we live in a in a on a bit on a bitcoin standard people would also have more time to figure out what they're actually good at right like wh what the value is that they could bring into the world and i kind of get this feeling sometimes you know when i when i think about new york right like there's so many people everyone has a hustle like you could have one company this week and if it fails you just start another next week like there the, it's not that people have the time it's more that there are so many people that i can start any business but i think in a bitcoin standard it would be like i have enough time there's no pressure well yeah there's pressure but i mean more like now there's pressure to just stick with a job to get money so people do jobs that they hate and they are unhappy etc they don't bring all of their value to the world whatever whatever that could be and yeah my idea of bitcoin standard is that people would actually have that space and it would also be very good that you figure out one week into your cookie store that you suck at you know or cake store yeah. that you suck at making cakes like that's a good thing you know absolutely uh, so i see that no, i, yeah, I, I could, see that as a positive thing i can see that working the one example that i'm I have no idea because it only just came to me as you were talking was what we're seeing out of the US. So they're going through their election cycle at the moment. And this topic of forever wars, where the US goes into wars that they don't need to fight inserting themselves on the what whatever platform it's for democracy, it's to stop weapons of mass destruction in that scenario. And if you pull it back to before we were on a fiat system and we we're on the gold standard, it was you would raise taxation and issue bonds from the government in order to fund the war, but you've sold the people that the war was necessary. Yes, it, that one's not necessarily tied to a capitalist society where, to your point, and I completely agree, in a, on a Bitcoin standard, uh, you would, on a more merit-based economy, it would unlock a whole raft of, of unused potential in people because we're not just slaves to to the fiat system. But on that geopolitical front, on that nation front, that's the part that I don't know how exactly it would play out. But I would see that if, for example, the bad actors still exist within politics, if there mm -hmm. is still the, you know, the 4D chess being played around how to eng social engineer people into believing that wars are good or that some intervention is good and who knows what it's going to be in the future. Maybe it's a space war because we're in the Elon Musk era of asteroid mining and there's something there that needs to be spent on. Like who knows what the scenario is? Mm -hmm. How would that play out there? I don't think it'd be as, as extreme, but I could see how that could still be exploited. Yeah. So the loop I see in my head is, uh, and I like the example, I think it's also Safety Namus who talks about, you know, back in the day when there was like two armies that went at it, they had limited resources. They had their gold, their equipment and their men, right? And if 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 one side would would be winning, you know, to a certain degree, the losing side would be like, okay, what agreement would you like to make? Because there wasn't an infinite resource to... Yep just get more men get more machinery and and all these things right so their 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 funding was limited so their ability to fight was also limited and i think if we project that to let's say a bitcoin standard but there's still people who want to wage war to other countries you know where where do they get the money from to do that you know it could be taxes but if we live in a bitcoin standard world i think you know, it goes back to maybe the cake store example. Like if, if the government wants to raise taxes, that's how it also went back in the day, raising taxes for war, right? It's like the English said, the Spaniards suck. Like I, I need your money. Uh, let's, yep. let's, let's go. Like I, I, we would return to something that's, that, that is similar to that, where the government should actually argue why the people should give them money to fix, you know, whatever, whatever they are proposing. So you either go back to that and then if the reward is Bitcoin, you know, you have to have a very good argument why, you know, we should go to war with the, you know, Spaniards again. Yeah. Or, you know, if, if, if we still live in this parallel world, you know, they would print money, they would go to war, 
the, the fiat money would, inf- you know, would be devalued even more. And that would eventually only accelerate people moving to this other system. So I'm thinking right. about what is, I think it's what is the core that we're talking about, right? Like, I think it's muted, but still possible. Yeah, but no, no way near to the same it. degree. Yeah, yeah they'll these try people it. will try it. And that's why it takes a long time, right? I think that's yeah. also very interesting to realize, you know, people talking about the Bitcoin price every day and all that stuff. Like, yeah, <laughs> don't think about that. Think about how, how, how can we, you know, I love the software thesis. I don't know if you have read uh, that uh, book by uh, Jason Lowry. Where he talks. No, about not yet. Software. What was the name? Sorry. Soft War. Soft War so, so, software minus the, yeah, that's his, I think it's MIT thesis where, you know, this power projection will always be there, right? Like the, the, the world is one big risk game, like the game of risk, you know, and there's always power projection because that comes from nature. That's what he shares, right? But there's always this calculation of the energy that I'm expending. Is that less than what I'm receiving back? Right. So a cheetah would never yep. uh, attack an elephant, for example. And so if you can agree that that will always exist. So there will always be actors that will try to use their power projection to earn resources in, in whatever way. You know, war will always be there or struggle in a certain sense because that, that will probably not die because it's just part of nature. So also between people so there will always be people that do that but if so this is this is the 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 quickest summary i could give of the software thesis is that he says you know software what he means is it's going to be a war of hashing power of protecting you know if bitcoin is the most important resource to own it's going to be about protecting your resource and protecting that means you have to contribute to the network so you have to add, add hashing power to add hashing power, you have to be innovative, right? So you have to find ways to get the cheapest energy that's available in, you know, yep. whatever region you control. And that would actually incentivize lots of innovation. That would, you know, mean that we would be more efficient at harvesting energy from the sun and solar, wind, or, you know, in, in whatever way. And I once tweeted to Jason, like, okay, so because there will be forever wars between people, with Bitcoin, we will also save the planet. And he said, yes. <laughs> you know, so that's, that's like the <laughs> so epitome. Good. That's like the epitome of, of, of that thesis is like once you, you know, just like we should accept that there's always greed in people, that people will corrupt the system, that they, you know, where they find an open door to, to do that, you know, war, power, struggle, power, projection will always be there. But if that is fought or that is fought because people want to acquire or protect the, the best asset in the world, that that will eventually be like the primary thing where like all these incentives will battle with each other, but the outcome will be a positive one. Yeah, cool. I've added that to my reading list. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I love that. So yeah, I, I, I love this exploration of, you know, I think I think you can talk about Bitcoin at all these different levels. I think we went through a few. Quite a bit. I also wanted to ask you, you had another article where you, and, and I love this because I think, you know, modern slavery is is probably a bad word you know in the current day or people would be uh, triggered triggered by that but you you have an article about this and i wanted to ask you how and i think we touched upon it when i said you know this progression is blocked and you said you know no my time and energy is stolen so i think it ties into this but yeah how would you define modern slavery as you use the term in the context of like fiat money system and cool. uh, debt forced labor etc so this article came the inspiration for this one is outside my day job. I'm also a non-executive board director on nonprofit board here in Australia. And one of the things that we had to do as directors un- with obligation was to ensure that there were no modern slavery practices through the supply chain of our organizations. And we had to sign off as a board that we've done the due diligence to do that. So modern slavery in my mind was already big. And I knew that I knew that an element of that included debt bondage. And so I knew that there was a link towards fiat and whatnot, but I went through a more structured approach so that it wasn't just a, hey, fiat causes is going to make us the biggest modern slave owners in human history. It was, no, no, I went methodical and I started from first principles and said, well, what is modern slavery? And there's, and I give three definitions from three different sources in there, the US, the Australian government, and then an antislavery.org. They all point to that debt bondage constitutes modern slavery. 
then you go down the rabbit hole, okay, well, what is debt bondage? What does that actually mean? And from the definitions, I pulled out three key points that that effectively passes the test of calling something debt bondage. Number one, it's inheriting of debt, constitute debt bondage. The reasonable value of the debt not being used to liquidate it. And the third being the length and nature of the debt not being limited or defined. And so when you pull on that, there are two of those three that align to the fiat system. The first one is the inheriting of debt. And the second one is the length and nature of the debt not being limited. So if I start with the first one, inheriting of debt, any debt that is incurred as a result of deficit spending by a government is automatically inherited by the next generation, regardless of what the government does. Yeah. So it let's can translate that. Let's, yeah. So let's translate that, right? If your government borrows money and to spend more than what they earn, they will have a debt that they ha- will have to pay off. And anyone working in that country contributes to paying off that debt, first interest, then the principal, yep. right? Through the taxes that they pay on their work. And if you want to know what that looks like, I would say go to usdebtclock.org. And on the <laughs> yes. top left, on the top left, you see the US national debt. And next to that, it says debt per citizen. And then it says debt per taxpayer. Debt per citizen. So if you want to talk about debt bondage, if you get born in the US today, the US already has $104,822 in debt for you. So you inherit that yep. already. Once you become a taxpayer, it's 269,269. And I, once I discovered the debt clock, I was mind, I was mind blown. <laughs> but yeah, I would, I would suggest ridiculous. people to check that out. Right. But this is what the debt bondage is. It's basically money has already been spent, whatever in a deficit. So as a debt and it's up to you to help your government or your country pay that back. And here's the part that turns it into debt slavery, because I think that in isolation isn't debt slavery if there is a promise or an understanding that it would get paid back within that generation from whom borrowed that money. So if it's paid within a generation, not debt bondage, because technically it's not getting inherited, and then there's a defined time. The problem that we have in our system, and this is the difference between the letter of the law and the intent of the law. The letter just says the words that we've written down that we hope expresses a law or regulation as well as we can. If we just follow those words, we've done it. Great. The reality is often if you follow the letter of the law, you can often not deliver against the intent of what the lawmakers were trying to do with those words. And this is a great example. The way that debt is issued is by governments taking out government bonds that are bought by a reserve bank or the open market, and they pay a coupon rate, and then they have to pay the principal back at the end of that bond term. So five-year bond, 10, 20, 30, whatever it might be. And so the letter of the law would say that it can't be debt bondage because there's a defined term in which that debt exists, five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Yeah, exactly. The problem is there is zero intent from the government to ever pay it back. They're just going to roll it over. They're just going to take another 30-year bond to pay off the existing 30-year bond and reset the clock for another 30 years. Yeah. Like a credit so card with a new credit card. Correct. And mm-hmm. so the intent is never to pay it off. So by the letter of the law, not debt slavery, not debt bondage, sorry, not modern slavery. But by yeah. the intent of what those definitions were getting at, it 100% is because the government is always going to deficit spend. And so to your point, when you actually look at that, 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 um, that's debt per citizen. And if you, in the US, it's worse, but I think in Australia, I calculated it. It is, we've fought, we've got two years already on the Australia's debt of forced labor from the entire working population of the country to pay it off. So effectively, the government has enslaved a future generation for two years already. Yeah, to pay off the current debt and it's just going to grow. We'll continue with that. I just want to add, I just Googled, I don't know if you know, Peter St. Ange, on, he, he talks a lot about this. 76% of the income tax in America is used to pay the interest on the debt. So three, three out of four days, almost four out of five, <laughs> you, you work to pay taxes for your government to pay interest on a loan that was probably started before you were born and spent 
on stuff that you never saw any any value of, right? Like it's also it's kind of like this black hole that you add your your energy yep. to because you just have no clue what it was spent on. And I would love to hear your rebuttal of like the simplest counter argument that I can come up with when, you know, you would tell this to people that, that they would say it's like, yeah, but the government pays for the roads and the this and the that, right? What, you know, but, but that would imply that they would do it in like a cautious and responsible way, right? But because they can, this is my thesis, right? If, if you can just borrow freely and you have no limitations, basically the money is infinite. You will get the opposite of what we just talked about. You know, if, if the asset or the thing you're using is finite, you will think twice about what to spend it on. So you have to have a solid plan. You are forced to have a solid plan because you basically cannot afford to lose your portion of this finite asset, right? And if you have an in infinite amount of resources that you just project towards the future in terms of eventually, you know, getting that back through the hopefully improved productivity of your people, yeah, then it, I think for me, it's a logical conclusion that you can assume that this has not been spent in a responsible way because, well, then I think you see that in a hundred percent example. So I'd say there's a, uh, if I, if I went the more detailed part, so the less layman, which is, I think is important for people to understand where my mind goes is on my board. When we make a decision about investing capital against a project, it has to be very clear. What's the return on that invested capital over what time period and anywhere through that project where we don't hit a milestone gate of giving us good indication that we're on track to deliver the benefit as described in that business case. If we're on track, great, keep going. If not, we're stopping. We're not wasting any more money because there's a lot of assumptions that are made when you first go to make an expenditure on a project that when you go through the project and you realize, oh, we didn't realize there was this sinkhole in this project. We're going to have to spend more money to do it. And like, oh, crap, this rock is far denser. It's going to take more money to drill through it. Eventually, you get to a break-even point where it's not worth doing the project anymore. Yeah. What the government has been able to do to your point is just keep printing. So that return on investment metric is out the door. Exactly. The second element that I would they, say- It is, only exists on paper, right? They talk about- Correct. It. Yeah. And never realized. The second one is the government is an insolvent company. The company would have gone- it would have gone through insolvency and bankruptcy decades ago, but because of the fiat monetary system, they've just propped themselves up. And so they're continuing down an insolvent path. So that's probably another one. And because there is no real accountability on the government to deliver against the return on investments for the money that's being invested through in the US, we'll use the US as, as an example through Congress and the House, there's no accountability whatsoever on any of these things. There's no, and because you've got the fiat exit ramp of we can just print more money if we don't quite hit what we were on, it's completely skewed what the, what proper fundamentals are around tax revenues serving the people on things that the government are responsible for. So we've seen the government responsibility widen. It used to be this. Now it's this. Everything's in the purview of the government. And we've seen expenditure go from here to, through to here, mm -hmm. and yep. yet no real return. So you're starting to see where all the corruption is starting yep. to go, the inefficiencies, the ineffectiveness, the rack return. And so, to your point, that's where it's going. It's going to nothing. It's going to. I, I think that's a good that's a good visualization, right? Like they have more authority without actually having earned it. Like there's nothing to show for the the growth of this authority. Yeah, that's great. Wow. Okay. We went a lot of places. I <laughs> think very, <laughs> very, very dense, very dense. I love it. Yeah, I want to be mindful of the time. I want to ask you two last questions. So we talked about, I think broadly and deeply about, about these different, I would say fundamental subjects or topics for people to, to, to study, to eventually, I, I would say, get to the solution that is Bitcoin, right? Of, I think we touched upon it. I, I honestly think that talking about the problem is more important than Bitcoin as a solution because most people just have, have no clue. But what do you need? What do you think is needed to drive adoption from, you know, yeah, well, you mentioned you are an early adopter, but I don't, I think you're still, we, we are below two and a half percent. So I think we're still early, but what do you think 
is needed to drive adoption to, let's say, the next phase of of, of adopting Bitcoin. You're asking questions as if you've you've read my my research plan for the next three months. So the <laughs> the piece that I'm researching at the moment is on the back of the last article I wrote, which was looking at Bitcoin and crypto adoption by population across the globe. Hmm. And it's part of the third pillar of my research, which is technology adoption curves, which looks at what's the traditional cycle that a technology goes through uh, in adoption at various points in time. Who are those people that adopt at those periods of time? And what are their, what's their hierarchy of need? Right now, we're at sub 10% global population adoption. But the nuance here is there are countries around the world that have crossed what is known as the technology adoption chasm, which is between the early adopters and the beginning of the early majority phase of adoption. And it happens roughly at the 16% population adoption mark. And there are five countries that have already shot across and I've forgotten the five, but off the top of my head, it was Thailand, it was Argentina, it was the UAE. And I'll quickly pull up the article while we're talking here so I can actually name these countries. Uh, Argentina, Turkey is, is in there as well, Singapore, and, and that'll do for now, right? But they've they've crossed the chasm. And the reason why that's important is these are the countries that we should be looking to to say, why is their population adoption so high what was it that resonated with those people? Because in the innovator and early adopter stage, you've got this profile of individual that is a high risk, high innovation mindset that are willing to take risks and take a stab at something, try something new. And I'd say that that's, that's where like you and I would sit somewhere in that 16%. When you get to the 17 to 50%, which is this early adoption range, that is when you have to start thinking, this is now the everyday person. And so you have to make the narrative around, in this case, Bitcoin resonate to what is meaningful and valuable to them. And so a lot of the podcasts that I hear today are still addressing that early adopter and that, and those, it, sorry, the innovators and the early adopters, those that hear this, oh yeah, the fiat monetary system, you know, it, it it's broken and, and whatnot. It's people that will see that as high risk and will say, yeah, we need to go after that. But when you're talking to a plumber or a carpenter, or you're talking to a school teacher, or you're talking to a baker, they're not going to care about that. They're going to care about what does this mean for me? And so to your question, how do we drive adoption? Depending on which country that you reside in, and I think this is where local podcasts is an example, like what you're doing, what I was on Robin Sayers one the other day as well, you know, what Robin does, what the Stack Boys do over in uh, the United States, but they're originally from Africa, is that they provide a contextualized narrative for why Bitcoin for their geographical audiences, which is important because when you're at different stages of adoption in each country, tailoring those conversations become more important. So we're about to hit the chasm in the US is at 16%. I think post this election cycle, we'll cross the chasm in the US and we'll start to see narratives emerge. But I think it's about now thinking about who are the people around you in your life that aren't going to be traditionally high risk takers and what is it that they really care about and then understand how Bitcoin solves to get to that outcome. And it's going to take different, a lot of conversations. We probably need 10 to 20 times the amount of Bitcoin podcasts that there are at the moment because there will be this one way of describing it, this one way of articulating it that will resonate with maybe five people. But when you've got heaps more podcasts with that are creating messages that attract five more people, that's when you start to get the snowball because it's tailored in a way that is contextual to who yeah. they are. I think that's going to be important. Love that. I think the one sentence pitch for Bitcoin for millennials would be everything that you were taught to do in your life was only possible by the people that taught you that. And the assets that you think you should use to build a future for yourself and you know millennials are starting families or having young families right or progressing in their careers the logical conclusion that i came to as a risk aversive person was was bitcoin and i think bitcoin is just the best way for millennials to build their future build their families and yeah that's what I want to do. And I, I love what you shared because I think it's very true. I think it's also a reason why we should never stop talking about Bitcoin because this is going to take two, three generations before we get to uh, what, what we talked about. And, you know, there will be periods of acceleration. 
But I think there will always also be periods of like battles still with this old system because the old system is just yep. it's not going to die in an in an instant, right? So we will we will keep that. I love that, man. All right, last question, and I ask everyone the same question. Shoot. What's a core belief that you will never let go? It's a core belief. Change is the only constant. Boom. Love that's that. one that's guided me my entire career. All right, man. Well, let's end with Short that. I, 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 I really love this. I think we went really deep. We should definitely do that another time. And yeah, man, I want to appreciate, I want to appreciate, or I appreciate your, your time. And I will link to, you know, your, your online profiles, your research publications so people can check out. Appreciate it and love the work that you do. Awesome, man. Cheers. Cheers. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, also make sure to check out this video right here or go to my page and check out all the episodes of Bitcoin for Millennials. I appreciate your support and hope to see you for another episode. Bye.